Welcome to the Jamoti Podcast. We are all surrounded by amazing coaches and leaders. So let's get an inside look at not just what they do, but how they do what they do. After all, becoming the best versions of ourselves is Jamoti, just a matter of doing it. Coaches, we are all searching for ways to better evaluate players in order to give meaningful feedback. Over 15 years ago, I put together a test called the Jamoti Skill Rating. The JSR takes players through a series of tests involving basketball skill or athleticism, giving them one rating at the end. Their JSR rating will give you clarity on what needs to be discussed with players and parents on areas they need to focus on improving. I test our players at least four times each year. They're able to compete against each other, pass players' scores, and most importantly, their past performances. If you'd like to start testing your athletes, email me at jamotipodcast at gmail.com for more information. Confidence. It is one of those areas that I think I think coaches we get that we can't necessarily create confidence out of nowhere. Right. You know, their confidence has to come from some of the work that they've already done, the belief that they have in themselves. But we can, and you've you've kind of said this with the way we speak, our nonverbal and verbal communication, we can influence the direction of their thoughts about themselves and their confidence. How do you build confidence in your players if you see that they're starting to go down a little bit? Yeah, I think there's a number. Of th- and then again, that's that's also a very hard question because if there was a surefire, it's kind of like it's very different building confidence and you know, helping someone improve their free throw shooting or, you know, making a layup because there are certain tactics, techniques, um, me- mechanics. It's a better word. Yeah that are involved and they're consistent with everybody. Confidence is such a different thing, but here are some things. Uh, Number one, I don't like to substitute for a mistake. Never have. I I never have. Now, if it's something egregious, if someone, you know, fails to like die for a loose ball and somebody else beats them to it, or somebody um, doesn't talk on a screen and their teammates gets clobbered, that might be a quick sub, but I'm talking about a turnover, maybe a missed shot or a missed layup or a, a, a something, you know, even a missed defensive assignment that was, you know, you could uh, just had a scramble and I missed it, whatever. I don't like to, because I like players to be able to work through things. I'm, I like to tell, again, non-verbally tell them, look, it, I recognize you made a mistake. We'll talk about it the next dead ball or the timeout when we come over. Hey, you got to cut. You're the tag person on that pick and roll. You have got to come from the corner. You understand? Okay, good. I just don't like to suck because basically what the message I think I'm sending is I don't think you messed up. I don't think you're capable of, of playing through this. I got to get somebody else in. Yeah. So that's number one. I, I really now, again, if it happens repeatedly, that's different. And if it's something that we've talked about a lot and this is where 14 games in and this is happening repeatedly. I might on that, but I'm just saying initially, I don't like to do that. Second thing, I think showing them, I call them feel good clips. They might be 90 seconds to three minutes, but clipping good things that they've done. Again, an old educational adage. I learned this as while being certified in, in college, I was secondary ed certified teacher. And one of the things I learned in education class Educational psychology actually was a class. Catch them doing something good and praise them. Mm. If you want to repeat behavior, if you want behavior to be repeated, catch them doing something good and praise them. So I will clip good things. I'll also clip. I have two things on my clip. Highlight and learning. Highlight and learning. I don't hammer mistakes. I'll point out some things. And again, we're talking about this is learning. It's not personal. But if I feel a player, Matt, is really struggling with their confidence, at some point I'm going to pull them in. We're going to show them like a 60-second, 90-second, two-minute maybe highlight. To, these are all the good things you've done. These are what This is what you're capable of. This is who we see you as as a player. So this is what you've got to get to. And then, again, there's nothing more for me that builds confidence than preparation. Mm-hmm. So if somebody's struggling with passing into the post, we're going to get a grab a couple practice players. We're going to get 10 minutes before pre-practice. We're Extreme going to ownership, out. right? Yes. Yes. We're going to practice feeding the post 10 minutes before practice. 
Um, I love this. We got two players on our team that last year really struggled with lateral movement defensively. They weren't bad athletes, but every drive they would open up their hips. Uh, you know, Don, second step cutoff, right? They really struggled with that. So we brought in practice players, and, and, and at their request, I love them for this because they're the ones that said, hey, can you work with us on one-on-one -on -one defense? So we had a stretch this summer. They probably went in, you know, seven or eight times, and we had practice players, and actually it was the spring and summer, where they worked on – we would take 10 to 15 minutes, and we would just work on one-on-one -on -one defense, mm -hmm. on cutting people up. We'd play one-on-one -on -one different places on the floor. We'd put them at a slight disadvantage. And so, again, confidence comes from preparation. Confidence comes from demonstrated ability. That was another Coach Meyer thing that he got from Bill Parcells. You, you get great preparation. You do demonstrated ability. And then I think you've got to reinforce that to yourself. I think players have to take a, a, certainly – a great level of responsibility and ownership for their own confidence. Yep. So reinforcing to yourself, you know, one of the things that I'm so big with players about how you talk to yourself yeah. is more important than just listening to yourself, how you talk to yourself. You've got to believe that you are capable. You've got to tell yourself. I know Mitch Kupchak, when I worked his camps, Mitch is now GM with the Charlotte Hornets, but He's a great player at UNC, was an Olympian, played with the Bullets, the Lakers, the Washington Bullets, who's now the Wizards, but, you know, had a great NBA career. And he had an affirmation tape. And he would play to himself, I'm in superior condition, and I will outlast my opponents. I am a fierce competitor, and no one outworks me. Interesting. I am a hard-charging rebounder, and I am I can get any rebound that I pursue. He would have seven or eight of these affirmation statements that he'd play on a tape recorder and literally it would be feeding his mind and feeding the confidence. It would, it would literally, as the great Tim Gergovich used to say, you've got to weed and feed your garden. You know, you got to weed and feed, you got to get the weeds out of there and you got to feed good things, you know? So that's really, really important. I think players don't do that enough. Mm. Coach, there's so much there. I don't even know where to start. I think I wrote, I jotted down a couple things. Um, Dina Evans, Dina Evans took over for Dick DiVenzio when he passed That's away in 2001 and she ran PGC and great. I know story. where you're going with this. The great <laughs> message on confidence that she gave. Uh, you you want to do it? You want me to do no, it? You, you do it. Yeah. Man. She I know said, she going. said, she said, nobody can take your confidence, but you can give it away. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that is they're, they're, we have to teach our players, and I love you, you said it, responsibility that they have for their level of confidence so that if a mean fan, a teammate, a negative coach, or a bad coaching moment from a coach that, that normally is positive because we have those, could be apparent at times. Yeah. How about social media? Getting social on, media, yeah. Getting on the, Twitter and saying, oh, so-and-so's got a jump shot that's broke. Yeah. If they are starting to feel that that those negative thoughts in their head and they're they're feeding those, they got to understand that that's on them. Yeah, take that extreme ownership of their confidence, but it's all based on the preparation. Because here's one thing we can't do is we can't lie to ourselves. We can't look in the mirror and say, I, "I've never flown a plane before." I've never done uh, uh, any lessons. I've done no flight time. I've not been in a simulator. I cannot be confident in flying a plane. If I do, I'm insane. Yeah. And, and something bad is about to happen. But I think players sometimes, especially early on, they may do some things in games and seem to have some confidence in something that you they do know and we know that you you haven't really spent a lot of time on that. That's where – the discipline, accountability, the truth message comes in and, yes. and some of the other things. Um, but that that well, that was one thing. Oh, no question. Well, you know, and, and that's the, her thing, by the way, on confidence. I don't know. You could probably Google it and get some. I watched that thing. I took no. That's one of the best talks about yeah. confidence that I have ever seen. I thought she was so she made so many great point she i thought she was spot on with some of the things that she discussed but you know um what you were just talking about there matt reminded me one of the things that that bothers me at times 
when a player, they'll miss a couple shots and they'll go, what's wrong? What's wrong? You know, nothing's wrong, okay? If something were wrong, we we would have helped you correct that before. But you've got to develop a level of trust in your shot, in your abilities, in in your in, in your um capacity to execute yeah. and carry out whatever it is that we've asked you to do. You have to have a high degree of confidence. And if you don't, let's come in, let's rep it out, let's get some high quality game like reps so that when you get back out there, again, it's it's kind of like you know, a, a boxer. They don't just go, hey, I'm going to go enter a, a, a box. I'm just going to. No, they're going to go. If they're smart, unless they want to just get tore up, they're going to go and they're going to train. They're going to get with somebody and they're going to train. They're going to hit the heavy bag and the speed bag and put together combinations. And they're going to, you know, train their body and get their body in peak physical condition. Then they're going to spar. And then they're going to develop through all that preparation, a level of confidence to go and let, now I'm going to go in the ring and actually do it against somebody else. Yeah, and that's one of the things. If a player, if your confidence is even remotely shaky, let's number one, let's go back and let's rep it out. Let's go back and let's get to that skill. Obviously, your habits aren't strong enough yet. They're not where they need to be. You know, repetition creates a habit. Habits create success. Very mm-hmm. simple formula. So let's rep it out. Let's get our habits tighter and stronger. And then let's go execute. And now when you do make a mistake, let's learn from it. Let's, again, the old Meyerism, Ralph, recognize, admit, learn, forget. There's there's an acronym right there. It's not <laughs> Ralph like, you know, Ralph Nader or Ralph uh, uh, Gar, the old baseball player for the Atlanta Braves. It's Ralph, R-A-L-F, recognize, admit, learn, and forget. So you've got to prepare yourself. And then when mistakes happen, recognize it, own it, but move on from it and continue to believe that, listen, I will find a way yeah. to get this done. I will find a way to get this done. You know, uh, again, I'm going to really deviate for a second here. You're good. Great, great book to read is Red Circle, Brandon Webb. If anybody likes stuff about the Navy SEALs and some of the stuff, there's a great little piece in there, a few pages, and it's called Fire in the Gut. And basically... He was a poorly conditioned candidate that was in buds. He was, by his own admission, he was just, he was holding the class back. (laughs) The class was getting punished for everything that he was messing up and his physical capacity was very poor. So the instructors and and some of his classmates started to resent him because they were getting punished and the instructors were on him more, more viciously and basically were trying to get him to quit. So one day there was a moment of truth where they separated him and he got circled by a group of, of hardcore instructors. There were about three or four of them, as I recall, and they were on him. And basically, I won't use the words that he used in the book, but they were basically telling him what, what a worthless piece of, uh, of, of excrement that he was and other things, and basically trying to get him to quit. And he, he said, for all that I lacked physically, one thing that I had, and I always had as a kid, was an incredible mental strength. And I looked at the one guy particularly who was coming at me the hardest, and I told him, you can do whatever you want to me. You can kill me in this next evolution, but the only way you're going to get me to leave this program is in a blankety blank, blank, blank body bag. And the guy looked at him. He said, I thought he might kill me on the spot, but he looked at me to gauge me if I was serious or if I was just talking smack. And he could tell I was serious. And he basically told me, okay, get back with your crew. You've got to have that type of tenacity if you if you're going to succeed at anything hard. Keeping somebody in front of you on defense is hard. Getting rebounds is hard. Finishing through contact is hard. Making a pressure jump shot is hard. So if you're going to do that, you've got to rep it out. And what he did to finish that story, he got extra PT and he became one of the best guys in his class because he went with extra PT, he realized the shortcomings. But you've got to have that type. You've got to have Brandon yeah. Webb type of tenacity to say, I am not quitting. I am not giving up. I believe in myself. I'm going to get through this one way or another. I'm going to find a way. Belief. You just said it. And and there's a great video uh, sometimes when I'm talking about shooting with athletes. And because I believe the the mental side to shooting is just. Oh, uh, it's more important than form. Assuming. Yeah. 
assuming that their form isn't isn't Lonzo Ball esque, assuming that it's not that you know that that it's like handwriting. You know, uh, you and I have different styles of handwriting, but as long as we can read the words, it's still the it's still right. We're and good. so, yeah, shooting is like that. But the mental side of it is just uh, almost 90 to 10, I believe. It I, just, I couldn't agree but, more. Couldn't agree more. Coach Knight used to say this about all phases of the game, but I think this pertains to what you're talking about. Mental is to physical as four is to one. So would you rather have I players look at me? It's funny. Now, that made sense to me, but I've used that over the years. And players look at me. They say, Dean, what are you talking about? What do you mean? And I said, well, simple. Would you rather have four $1 bills on the table? I got, I'm going to put two tables, $4 on one table, $1, which table? I'm going to put four $100 bills on a table or one, one, which, which, which table do you want? Well, they all say a oh, four. There you go. Mental is the physical as four is to one. So I couldn't agree with you more, Matt, on the shooting piece. The mental part of shooting is absolutely huge. That's what to me makes Curry. And I know we're just, we're going down a rabbit hole now. I, yeah. I it's what makes Curry so uh, unique it, it's not as mechanics it's obviously there's a there's ability off the bounce that just is he he really changed the game in that way the the difficulty the amount of space he could create or the lack of space he needed you know yeah. to get a shot off this the sheer speed of it but it's the confidence and it's the ability to shoot and believe that that thing's going in. I mean, I That's just cute. watch players shoot all day and they're basing it on hope. I hope it goes in. That mechanically does something different. Yes. It does something different to how you're moving that ball through air. Yes. Belief, though. Golly, huge. That, that's that's absolutely huge. Well, you know, going back to something you referenced uh, a short time, <coughs> a short time ago, excuse me. The, the the talk Dean Evans gave, do you remember she used that example of her with Rick Carlisle? They used to shoot together sometime. And she talked about he he would miss some shots and he'd miss several in a row. And then he'd switch. Like I forget she used and I think she gave actually a number. Like they had this thing that they did together. They competed and maybe it was 15 shots. And one time, like he missed like, you know, 11 or 10 out of the 15. And there were other ones that he just knocked in. And she said something. She said, Rick, are you like mad about those 10 you missed? He said, yeah, but did you see those five I made? <laughs> they were, I mean, those were pure. Those yeah. were right. I mean, those were nothing but net. Mm. And that's how great shooters, when we talk here about, we use the phrase, they have very short memories and they have very deep faith. They have very short memories and they have very deep faith. Great shooters, they have short memories. And they have deep faith because they know, man, that next one's in. I don't care, man. I missed three and that next baby is going in and I'm letting it fly. Great video on with Draymond Green talking about belief. And he's just he's just sitting at a press conference and he he said uh, at some point you believe that you could be good at something before yes. you were good at something. You believe that one day you could be. I, th I thought of this from your your the story with the, the circle the red circle. And he said, and then you worked really hard at that and you became good at that thing. Yes. I think when we're talking to, to players about belief in what they're doing, it has to, you might not be good at that action yet, but you have to believe that at one point you can, because if there's a lack of belief that it could ever actually happen, you're less likely to go through the steps that it takes to get to that point. But yep. a big part between belief and then it happening in between all of that is failures and improvements and failures. It's that it's that ladder. And but I think so many players, they they see something that they could want. They start to believe that they could do it. But then maybe there's a lack of a plan or a lack of follow through in the work that stops them from making it happen. The way he articulated that was you have your belief at some point it happens, but you work really, really hard in between there. And I think that's kind of the, the magic recipe, oh. right? Or the recipe right there. You're so right. And that's the thing. Belief without work doesn't work. I can believe all I want. If I'm not, yeah. if I'm a 58% free throw shooter and I'm not shooting a hundred, a couple hundred a day, to get myself, I can have all the belief I want, 
and maybe I'll improve to 59. You know what I mean? I can I can show myself yeah. mental movies. I can I'm, will you know, myself one percentage point. <laughs> yeah, you've all read those studies where they they, they did the mental imagery and that. I believe you can improve a little, but there is no way I'm going from 58 to 78 by but without getting in that gym and doing the work. So yes, there has to be belief is is the opening piece. That's the root. But now you have to put the fruit with the root, and the fruit is the hard work that you're going to do to to foster that belief and can continue to generate and feed that belief that you're going to excel and actually be better at this. That That's such an important piece. And I think that's a piece, again, that people miss. People miss that. They say, oh, yeah, I, I believe it. I believe. Well, part of believing it and making it a reality is doing the work that it takes. There's nothing that replaces the work. I don't care what it is. You, you've got to do the work. And, you know, it is something else. One of my favorite groups of all time is the Eagles. And I watched a special on them. And this so applies to, I've told this story to teams several times over the years. Some kids now don't know the Eagles, so I have to, <laughs> you know, I'm showing my generational gap. <laughs> but they did a special. And one of the things that Don Henley in one of the interviews, they ask him about it, you know, well, how'd you guys, I mean, your sound so unique. And some of the, he said, you know, if, if you're going to be good in this thing, you've got to develop a high tolerance for monotony and repetition. Because what we did in that studio, there'd be times where it'd be, it'd be 10 after three in the morning and we'd all be tired, but it wasn't quite right. We just didn't get it right. So if you're going to be really good in this thing, you got to develop a high tolerance for monotony and repetition. And I'm telling you, Matt, honestly, in my opinion now, this is strictly me. I think that chases more people away from excellence than any other thing. They simply do not, they have the belief, they have the desire, but they don't have the will to persevere through monotony and repetition. They just simply don't. And I think that chases more people away from dreams, objectives, goals, excellence, however you want to phrase it. I think that's the number one thief is that they just simply don't develop a high tolerance for monotony and repetition because there's no other way. Yeah. There's no other way. That, that, that's one part of the game for all the ways the game's changed. When I was born to now, the same. When I've been in the ground 100 years and the earth is still here, that's going to be the same. There's only one way you acquire skill, and that's through repetition. And coach, that's why this is an unpopular message, I, but that's why not many people make it. That's right. And whatever whatever field you're talking about, let's just talk about college basketball. Why are there so many high school players, but so few of them make it? Just, not just besides the fact that there's only a few seats available. Because it's not like you've got all of them that are actually going for that, those seats, yep. right? <laughs> That's, yep. Oh, Micah Lancaster, coach. Oh, he's one of my favorite skill guys. And, uh, you know, you, you can almost like just cut a line right down the middle of people that believe in that type of skill work and people that think that that's a, it's a gimmick or waste of time. I, I happen to see with some of his accountability tools, some of the game behind what he's doing. And especially with younger players, ways that I can maybe help them to connect some dots quicker. That's just, that's, uh, let me get past that part. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Michael Lancaster has this video out and it's called I'm possible math. Cause that's his deal is the I'm possible. I'm possible. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, he's a spring Arbor. We went to the same school. We played. Oh, at the same he's nice. a spring Arbor guy. So you're a fan. And, uh, no. a spring Arbor Cougar. <laughs> well, he says you actually have an 84% chance of playing college basketball. And that throws, I mean, because most people just throw out that 3%, but he says, you got to take all the kids. And first of all, not all of them really want to play anyway. And it's true. I, I have a lot of players on my team. They don't, they would not raise their hand to that question. So you yep. take them out, that number goes up the percentage. And then out of the ones that say that they actually want to do it, how many of them have a plan and are willing to, like you just said, actually execute that plan and stick through the monotony and the boring times. That brings that number even or higher because even less of the ones that say they want to do it are actually going to do the work necessary. Yep. And so that, that 84% chance, like I, I, that's that to me, that's the legit math, but it all goes back to coach. The fact that uh, one of my least favorite things I hear from parents or players is this idea of burnout. 
Like I don't, and I don't, I understand what they mean by burnout, but I don't think it's real or an excuse to stop working towards something that you say you really want because burnout is natural in anything. I love mint chocolate chip ice cream. If I had it every night, that sounds pretty darn good. I physically, I'd fall apart, but I would love to do that. But at some point, coach, maybe a week or two, three weeks of eating it every night. I'm a little tired of that. Like I want, I want to do, I want something different. You want to change. And in that moment, coach, I got to figure out how much do I love mint chocolate chip ice cream? Do I love it enough to continue to push through that feeling? So I don't like the excuse of why somebody's not willing to work towards something that that use of burnout or whatever it is. I was, oh, you got to be careful with I was called to do something different. Were you really? Because maybe that's true. Or was it just too much for you, too hard? You were done with it and you want to do something else. Yeah, I think I think it's hard to become great at anything. I don't care what it is, but it requires that that sacrifice, the ability to uh, master the boring, like Ray Allen said, right? Yes, yes. And again, to me, the root the, of all of that, the underpinning of all of that, that that what we're talking about now, the that gets you in the gym, that gets you to develop a high tolerance for monotony, repetition, to have the discipline to get in, do the reps. You have to love it. If, if you don't love it, I know Coach Izzo in his uh, staff room, meeting room, he's got a phrase up there. He's got like it, love it, live it. Yeah. And he talks about, he said, you know, at one point he said, you know, we had a lot of guys in the like it category, maybe a few in the love it. I don't know if we have enough, maybe one or two in the live it. And now we're getting more, you know, so every year he kind of, he and his staff, and I'm not in on those meetings, obviously, but they Mm -hmm. talk about how many guys just like it, how many guys love it, and then how many guys live it. And if you're in that love it to live it area, you're going to relentlessly pursue something that, I mean, again, I, I there's so many examples that we can use of, the, but again, you think of somebody that loves music and they just relentlessly play their instrument and they, you know, continue to, to evolve and, and take lessons and create new things. You think of a writer, people who are aspiring writers, you know, before they even hit it, they are writing constantly. They're writing journals, they're writing articles, they're writing things that never get published. They're working mm-hmm. on their craft. Uh, they're, they're, we can just go through, you know, all areas of life. People who love something are going to pursue it passionately and relentlessly. Do you need periodic breaks? Certainly. And only the person knows what that is. It might be a day. It might be two days. Occasionally, it might be a week. After, let's say, seven, six months, four months of just battering, battering, some kid might say, look, I need a week away. That's fine. Steve Kerr took six weeks. He was like, the NBA season was so much. I needed six weeks of just nothing. Yep. Yeah, and that's the thing. That I mean, I can't imagine the grind of 82 games and the <laughs> travel and all that. But at some point, he's back in that gym. Yep. He's working on his craft. He's thinking about what's next. What can I do better? How can I improve? How can I evolve? And I, I firmly believe, I've never talked with him, but I firmly believe watching him play, I think it's his love for the game. Yeah. I think it's his love for what he's doing. And I think if we love anything, we're going to pursue it with passion. We're going to be relentless in trying to develop ourselves in those things. And I just think that's a byproduct of love. I think love is so powerful and I think it conquers all. Coach, I think you've really just brought it all the way back. Our talk to the very beginning, which is that's cool is, you know, I, I, I lived it. I've I've made a ton of mistakes in my life. Like mm. my tw- coach, my twenties were a mess. I call them the dark years. Before <laughs> I, before I met my wife, those were yep. those were tough years. But before that, with basketball, I have no regrets. And yep. so living it, I think, allowed me to do it. But when I got to college, I was blown away at the amount of college players that just liked it. They were athletic enough. They had some natural ability. But coach, living it allowed me to steal time from them. 
Yes. And and <laughs> but but not always, not always. But oh. going but going back to so now I love that. I, I I love that. I've heard that phrase before. The like it, love it, live it. Going back to being a high school coach, now obviously there's some schools like in this Dallas Fort Worth area, Duncanville. I mean, all the varsity players there are going to be college players. They there better be a level of at least love it to yes. be able to even make it there. But at my level, coach, I've got a lot of dudes that just like it. And the I think here's the challenge for us as coaches. It goes back to the relationship piece that you talked about at the very beginning is we got to know where they are on that scale. And we also, and we got to be okay with where they are on that scale Yes, because the kid that's 12th on my bench that just likes it, wants to be a part of it, that gives his very, very best, but has no aspirations beyond doesn't even think about basketball when he leaves. I've got to love and care about that guy and coach him the same way as I do as my, maybe my best player that I think loves it. Maybe there's a glimpse of live it kind of like coach. I, I think that's, that's difficult for, for a lot of us. And, but, yes. Yeah. Well, here's the thing on that. And this is where, again, and, and you can we can wrap up with this if you want, because I don't want dinner to get cold. And I don't <laughs> want you to have family time. But honestly, and it, we've got to have a bigger picture in mind, Matt. And again, what did Coach Meyer, the, the, the great Coach Meyer, I'm going to quote again. You have to have an overriding purpose for why you coach. Hmm. And what you've just talked about there. You want every play in your pro as much as you're going to challenge them and hold them accountable and try to help them be better and help your team be as good as it can be. I think a duality of your purpose, you also want to impact a life and you want to impact lives in a positive way. You want that 12th guy, number one, to feel valued, number one, to feel a part of something special, and number three, to learn life lessons from the time with you and your program that will carry him into the challenges and opportunities that he will face down the road. And if you're doing that, Matt, and if all of us are doing, I don't care what level we're at. If we're doing that, we're doing something very special. And that's part of the, the sacred journey. I call it the sacred journey of being a coach. There's some very hard things. There's some very challenging things. There's some, you know, you get some of the, you know, you know, you get adulation, sometimes undeservedly so. You get criticism, sometimes undeservedly so. But we get all of these things. But the part of the sacred journey is that you're impacting a life. You're saying words every day that somebody, I can remember my grade school. I remember the first coaches I ever had all the way through my college coach. I remember specific things they said to me and the impact of those words and how powerful they were and how I carried many of those things through much of my life so far. Mm. And that's a very incredibly, incredibly valuable perch that you're on. And it's a very powerful perch and one we need not take lightly. It, it's it's so important to recognize. So in addition to, yes, I want to open the gym and I want guys in there shooting and getting better. And I want guys who are hardcore. Comp- yes, all of that. Of course, but through the vehicle of basketball, you're teaching life lessons that are going to go far beyond basketball and far beyond if these kids ever play. And I'm, I'm going to give you something at West Point that stuck with me for all these years. I worked at West Point from 1983 to 86, made an incredible, indelible impression on my life in so many ways. But there was a quote by Douglas MacArthur that I'll never forget. Upon the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that upon other fields on other days will bear the fruits of victory. And what you're doing right now, what you just described is exactly that, that upon the fields of friendly strife, high school basketball, college basketball, whatever our our arena is, we're sowing seeds that will bear fruit on other days that we hope will bear the fruits of victory. These young men are going to be better fathers, better husbands, better community members, better sons. Our players are going to be better, you know, with their families and their community people. That's our overriding mission. And if we're doing that, you're you're a champion. I don't care what the scoreboard says. You're a champion. Thank you for checking out today's episode. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, share it with your fellow coaches, and find us on social media for what's coming up next on the Jamoti podcast. It's just a matter of doing it.